Welcome back to The Beats this week with Kelly Kennedy. And today, again, I have my husband, Ian Kennedy, and we are going to talk about breath. And once again, uh, Ian knocks it out of the park when he talks about all these incredible practical ways to to engage your breath and why we want to engage our breath and what the breath is really about. As simple as some hand tricks that you can do to change your breath and change the feeling in your body. So you don't want to miss this one. Listen right to the end because at the end he goes through the little bit of the philosophy of breath, which I know you're not going to want to miss. So enjoy this episode of The Beats and we'll see you at the end. to the beats with Kelly Kennedy. And today I have my husband, my special guest, Ian Kennedy. Um, I'm not going to do an interview style because he's my husband. That would be weird. And he was my original mentor. And for those of you who enjoyed our previous episode with Ian, um, we definitely got the feedback that um, it's better if we just have a conversation than when we <laughs> interview. So that's good. And we appreciate all the feedback that we get. We really, really do. Yeah. So we want to talk about breath. Okay. Well, air and breath, it's kind of important. Air and breath is important and I appreciate the subject. Um, I'm an expert on breath. I've been breathing for 62 years. He's very funny. And hey, by the way, the class you did where you taught the people that did the inner engineering, yes. how to do that special yoga pose, I wanted to tell you, I keep forgetting to tell you, but take the afternoon now. Priscilla and a few others have commented how much that changed for them. Good. That getting the practice of learning how to do that particular breath work. Right, right. So why don't you tell everybody a little bit about inner engineering just to start with? I mean, let's dive in, right? With breath, <laughs> the inner engineering. Um, well, inner engineering is a program that's designed by SAG Guru. Uh, from the Isha Foundation, and it is this gentleman bringing a 15,000-year-old technology into the 21st century and really teaching people uh, that yoga is not about stretching your body. It's not an exercise. It is a way to create a stable platform so that you can then learn how to breathe in certain ways and allow meditation to overcome you, kind of like the way sleep overcomes you. So when I go to bed at night, I go, okay, I'm going to bed and I love you. And I lay down, I go, okay, now I'm going to sleep. That's not what people do. We get in bed, we create a certain environment, a certain atmosphere, and then we allow sleep. Sleep takes me over, right? I know mm -hmm. that it's happening. Mm -hmm. Meditation is the same way. So uh, the inner engineering program is a fantastic program to go through in order to really allow an individual to become more meditative instead of trying to meditate. So it's interesting because what you did was you just took yoga and meditation and combined them. And most people think of those as two separate adventures, mm -hmm, two separate mm -hmm. things. And I would agree that for somebody who tried to do yoga, and I do say try, how, what does try stand for again? I? Temporarily restricting yourself. Temp yes, I'm re reinforce that all the time. Whenever Silas says the word, he I'm says, I'm, try. Try. I'm temporarily restricting, restricting myself. myself. Yeah. So I did try to do yoga, particularly hot yoga, Bikram's yoga. I particularly wanted to get through those 26 poses. It felt like a challenge to me. Sure. And over 15 years that I tried those 15 or 26 poses, I probably hurt myself 37 times, had to stop, start over, blah, blah, blah. And I always competed with myself. I was always trying to get the perfect pose. Mm -hmm, I was always mm -hmm. trying to replicate those poses. Right. Then when I started doing Sadhguru's yoga and I did one pose three times in two different positions, literally all the, all the pain in my back that was here when I would meditate, when I would sit in the sitting Lotus type, my Lotus mm -hmm. form of position, mm -hmm. that burning pain would come in my mid back. Yeah. I did his yoga pose one series, one time that took four minutes cried, if you remember, mm -hmm. laid on the ground, cried because I felt like such a failure that I couldn't do these mm -hmm. stupid poses without the modifications, did the modifications, sat in, in Zazen, sat mm -hmm. in, and all of a sudden I had no pain mm -hmm. and I've not had pain since, and I've done those yoga poses. Yeah. And I, I really started to understand, oh, yoga, meditation, there is no difference. Well, it's the idea that you can't separate your body and your mind. Right. I want your mind to now it doesn't mean that your mind's not off somewhere doing something other than what your body's doing, but you can't separate the two. So it's the same thing with breath work in order to um, 
get into a deeper understanding and a deeper touch with your physical body, the breath is the way to do that, right? And so the breath controls our physiology in many ways. Um, and we know that, you know, if you breathe slower, you become more parasympathetic, your heart rate slows, your blood pressure drops. If you control your breathing in, in certain ways, the physiology shifts. If you control your breathing and you continue to do that, it also shifts our mentality, it shifts our mind. And the three primary things that show up when people practice breathing in a conscious way is your alertness will become higher. There's a, a higher level of alertness, awareness. There's a level of awakeness. Believe it or not, a lot of people are moving through their lives half asleep. Mm -hmm. So breath will help with awareness. Breath will help with the sensation of actually being awake. And the other thing that breath can manifest or help control on some level is anxiety. Those three things are deeply related to how a person breathes. In a conscious breath. Yeah. Well, or in an unconscious breath. If somebody's suffering from anxiety, oftentimes we find that they're not actually breathing. They're holding their breath or they're doing very shallow breathing. And which raises your heart rate. Which, which raises your heart rate, puts you into sympathetic. Right. And then my body feels like I'm in fight or flight. There's times when that's appropriate. And there's different breathing techniques that a person can do to go parasympathetic, to maintain a wakeful, alert state without being anxious. And then there's breathing techniques that you can use to raise the sympathetics so that you get ready to fight or flight. The first breathing, conscious breathing experiences that I ever had was as a teenager uh, in the martial arts. And it was a very simple thing. Our martial arts instructor said, every time you punch, kick, or block, you're going to exhale. Forget about breathing in, your body will do that normally. So never focus on breathing in. Just focus on breathing out with every single movement. Now, if anybody's ever been a weightlifter, same thing. You go to pick up something heavy, <sighs> you exhale. If I go to punch or kick or block, I exhale with a quick burst of air out. It in creates... rowing, we did it too. It was... <sighs> Right. As sure. you're exerting you that force, the force, you, you breathe exhale. out. Right. The other reason that in the martial arts you want to exhale whenever you're doing a movement is because it tightens my abdomen, it tightens my muscles, and it protects my body on an exhale. Think about falling down. Think about any time when you're going to protect yourself, you're going <gasps> to inhale and exhale. When we talk about coming onto the planet for the first time, what's the very first thing a child does? When I ask this, most parents say, oh, they cry. Oh, when a baby's born, it cries. Well, that's true, generally true. But to be able to cry, the very first thing I have to do is inhale. A child's very first experience on this planet is an inhale. And when you finally pass and drop this body, the last experience you have in the physical body is an exhale. Nobody breathes in and dies. Everybody breathes <laughs> out and dies. It's just the way it is. So my breath is constantly reminding me, my in-breath is life, my exhale is death, my in-breath is life, my exhale is death. And this is something that constantly goes on 24 seven from the moment you took your first breath, right? It connects us deeply with the planet. It connects us deeply with life. There is nothing more important than breathing, right? Try and not do it for four minutes and see how important it really is, right? right. And there are people that master their breaths. There are uh, free divers, right, that dive with no oxygen or anything. They take a deep breath and they go down. And you can, human beings can hold their breath for 10, 11 minutes. You have to practice that. You have to build yourself up to that well, to be able to do those when things. When Hoff teaches you how to do his breath to Correct. engage your parasympathetics while your body's in a fight flight state that mm -hmm. you can force it out of that sympathetic into a parasympathetic yeah. when the body's under physical stress to overcome that. Yep. Or you, and there's also breathing techniques where you can manifest a lot of heat in your body, like he does, which his. is what he does. So there's ways and all of those breathing techniques have been around for a very long time. Even when Hoff will tell you that he stole those techniques from Tibetan breathing techniques and Buddhist techniques that have been done for thousands and thousands of years, because it is a way that you can engage your physiology and your psychology. And most of us, especially in the West, don't think about breathing at all. Most people breathe with the top third of their lungs. They don't take a full breath. They certainly don't take a belly breath. 
And fortunately, uh, through my early experiences, I was trained to do that so much that by the time I was in my 20s, by the time I went into the service, I was unconsciously belly breathing. Um, in the service, they taught a very simple breathing technique, which is actually taken uh, from an Indian Kriya, which is called box breathing. Right. Right. And box breathing controls the anxiety aspect. So if you're under great stress uh, in the service, if, if they felt like we were going to go somewhere that was going to be in some kind of combat situation, they teach you to do box breathing, which is a four count in, you hold the breath for four counts. It's a four count out and you hold the bottom of the breath for four counts. And you just repeat this cycle. And when you do that, it'll slow your heart rate down. It'll bring your anxiety down so you can function much better because most people, when they're under stress, the heart rate raises and I'm not actually functioning as well as I should. And, and just to give those listening or watching a little background. So I was a ranger combat medic in our service for about nine years um, in the eighties and to nineties. And to understand that his training was for our services as the first line of defense. Rangers are the mm -hmm. first ones that jump into any situation. And he was the medic on that team. Mm -hmm. So he, I find it very interesting that our armed services are teaching how to do box breathing as the first line of defense for any kind of anxiety so and stress yeah. for our soldiers that are in a very stressful sure. environment oftentimes, right? So I just find that very interesting, have found that interesting. I just wanted to highlight that because- Any of the special forces, the SEALs, all those guys are trained to control their breathing because it controls your physiology, it controls your mind. And we know from the heart rate variability program that we use that was developed by a cardiologist in Russia, he used it to train what? Navy, Navy SEALs. SEALs. Yeah, he was a Navy SEAL. the Navy SEALs are like the top of the- yeah elite troops they're elite physical athletes yep, that athletes. can hold their breath for so long and the, sure. whoever can hold their breath the longest kind of wins <laughs> i mean really and who can manage and control, well, control their breath, your breath because yeah. when you control your breath you can control your emotions right i mean think about how you get up in the middle of the night and you stub your toe the first thing you do is what <gasps> do we do deep breathing when we're injured right? Yep. Anytime you're injured, it's a, <gasps> okay, I'm going to, children do it. It's a natural thing. It's an unconscious natural thing. The body will immediately start to do deep breathing to control the situation, to control your emotions, to allow the body to relax, to get out of sympathetic or to go into sympathetic. S sympathetics aren't a negative. That's right. It's a, they're, they're, it's a survival they're mechanism. They're super important as any yeah. other aspect. So you can't have the parasympathetics without the sympathetics. You can't have the sympathetics without the parasympathetics. And you need to vacillate through them all the time. One of the things that we can consciously do to help that vacillation is deep breathing. Because I find that a lot of clients sit on my table with specific issues, quote unquote, health issues. And a root, one of the root foundational causes from some of these health issues showing up like headaches and fatigue for sure, is that they're not breathing. They're not actually breathing. They've lost the ability to contact the, the self in relationship to breathing. And there's some fun exercises you can do to get re-engaged with your ability to breathe. And one of them is this. If a person sits on a chair and you take your hands and you put your hands down, palm down on your thighs, and you just naturally breathe, don't do any special breathing, just sit and notice how we breathe for a few minutes, maybe eight to 10 natural repetitions of an in-breath and an out-breath, just like you're sitting watching TV, okay? So a person does that for eight to 10. And then all I want you to do is flip your palms up and do eight to 10 breaths naturally again, and notice where the air goes into the lungs. I would say for about 70% so of the people, they instantly notice that when my palms are down, I breathe with the top of my lungs. And if I just turn my palms up, I tend to have a deeper breath <laughs> in the that. bottom of my lungs, right? We talked about that like a year ago. I forgot yeah. about it. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. And what's important is to realize that, and this is one of the issues in relationship to breathing, the positions of my hands can affect my breath. And what that really proves is this, my posture, my physical way I hold my body has more to do with how I breathe than almost anything else. And people are just unaware of it. How I sleep 
the positions I sleep in, the positions I sit in, the positions I stand in will all affect my ability to breathe as well as the positions of my hands. And think about how often throughout the day I do this. I'm up, I'm down, hey. Like He's moving doing? his hand back and forth for those back that are listening. Forth, back and He's forth. doing kind of like, eh. Palm up, palm down, hey, yeah. how you doing? It changes my breath. So it can be that subtle. Go ahead. I, well, I want to bring something up here. So this brings me back to all those years ago when you said, go, oh, you think you're out of pain? Great, go to the monastery and breathe, right? And I sat still and they told me to sit with my spine erect. Mm -hmm. And I first sat on a, a Zafu or something, a, some a kind pillow, of pillow. Cushion, yeah. And all my pain came back. Right. And they're like, oh, here, we'll give you a bench. Still had that pain. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, we'll give you a chair. You can lean back. And yeah. all the pain was still there. So it was twofold. One is I was trying to quiet down my mind. I wasn't distracted with the daily events of whatever. Right. And two, I was holding my posture, actually probably tensing my muscles right. by the way I was holding. Right. When I started to learn Sadhguru stuff, it wasn't so much about this unrealistic straight spine that isn't posture. real because right. right. that's not anatomically even proper. Right. You have natural A curvature curve. yep. in your spine yep. that I was never in alignment with if you will <laughs> and so as i started to go okay i can be relaxed and sit here and put a pillow and mm -hmm. you know get my spine get my to pelvis curve. to curve mm -hmm. for me mm -hmm. that's nice and then when i do that i don't have to hold my shoulders up i can just hold myself with my core and then oh and this brings me back to what yoga really does what right from the science of yoga isn't about stretching. It's about bringing your breath to the areas where you feel tightness, where you feel pain. And if you think about Bikram's yoga or any of the yogas and you do it from that intention, you'll have a very different yeah. experience. Absolutely. So, and that's what Sadhguru does. If you're, you know, the breath is going to all the areas of your body. And when your spine is in alignment with the magnetic field that's surrounding this earth and everything mm -hmm. in the universe, mm -hmm. when you're in alignment with that, then the energy fields are open to allow you to get the full access to all that energy and to bring that breath into all the spaces. Mm -hmm. Oxygen heals and mm -hmm. oxygen is what every cell needs to create Absolutely. energy, to create ATP on a yep. physi physiological basis. And if we're not getting breath to some area, then we have pain, we have yep. limitation, yep. we have illness in that yep. area. Sure. And so all those years ago, you said, go and be in the other room and breathe. And I was like, Okay, what do you want to do? How do you want to do it? Blah, blah, blah. And now here we are all these years later teaching people. I'm so happy teaching people that I, I had a client in here today. All the pills she wants to take, all the supplements, it's great. But she was literally holding her breath yeah. for her whole life. Yeah. And when she finally released her breath today was through some somatic um, body work that mm -hmm. we did, and then she went to your room and mm -hmm. continued to cry. She literally was crying, holding on me today, going, I want to come in next week. When I said, you don't have to come in for a few yeah, weeks sure. because she feels so relieved to let the breath go and to cry and release. And she could finally breathe. And she was gasping for breath in here for a while. I just find this so interesting for people sure. in their cases. Yeah. And it's, of life, it, case it's, of it's, life. It's, well, it's, it is, it's the thing that connects us. Right. It's the thing that connects us to life, you know. Um, there's so many different breathing techniques, depending on what you want to try and manifest and whether that's physiologically or spiritually or emotionally or whatever. Um, one of the things I like to say to people that are practicing their breathing and their conscious breathing, and there's lots of different ways to do it is it's interesting to get to a point where you feel like you are being breathed as opposed to you being the breather. So when I inhale, when there's an inhale, that's, that's the atmosphere going into my body. And then when I exhale, that's the atmosphere coming out. And if I use my imagination a little bit, I can think about the fact that it's breathing me. Like a pump. And I'm not breathing it. And right. so this is my string. In, in many Eastern philosophies, the breath is considered a string. The string goes in and this string comes out and it's the string that keeps me connected to this light. And when the breath stops, the light you stops. and the body fall apart. You and the body fall apart. When my breath ends, then then that aspect of my physical being is, is shifted. So, you know, playing with the breath, realizing that most of the day it's unconscious and can I be conscious about my breath more and more? And uh, you'd be amazed if you take even just three days 
of truly taking some time and doing conscious breathing, even if it's just the simple box breathing, um, one that is more possibly more beneficial in regards to creating parasympathetic is because the box breathing is considered to be kind of like water breathing. You can do it anytime. Um, a different type of breathing is what's called whiskey breathing, which is breathing more as if you were asleep. So it's an eight count in, no, I'm sorry. It's a four to five count in, and then it's a seven to eight count out. I'm going to exhale longer than I inhale. And this will make you very parasympathetic. Um, and, and on that note, that's a lymphatic move that I often teach people is to, you know, lymph is about letting go. And when I ask people to take a deep breath, I often get this. <gasps> they they focus no more on the, on the inhale, inhale than the exhale. Mm -hmm. And for the lymph, it's all about letting go. It's ex, ex, uh, what's the word? Expanding that exhale, accentuating that exhale. Mm -hmm. So I'll often say, you know, I want you really, I want you to sigh when you're on the table. And I find I get a lot of this. Uh, like just noise versus mm -hmm. oh. letting the air out. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And so I think just practicing even five sighs in a row, like take a breath yeah. in and consciously make your body go, oh, make some noise and truly exhale and really let it go because the lymph is about letting go. Mm -hmm. When you take a deep breath in, you're expanding your rib cage and then you it, you exhale and that rib cage shrinks and contracts all those muscles and it pumps that cisterna and it pumps that lymphatic fluid and you exhale and you breathe out more of your toxins. But yep. if you're shallow breathing like this, yep. you're not, gonna you're expel not those, expelling that, those that toxins. Load. Yeah. The other aspect of the breathing, which you touched on is, especially on the exhale, is tightening all the abdominal muscles and really squeezing the air out of your body. People don't do this, but it, you would be amazed how long you can actually exhale before the air is really, really gone. And it's a great exercise for your abdominal muscles where they literally concave all the way to the point where you really feel super thin and you're blowing all the air out, right? Isn't that called, um, you know, there's a, a lion breath, I think, right? You take, yeah, it's, I think it's called lion breathing, right? You take a big breath in and then you <sighs> all of it out and you let all that, you really push all the air out and then you do very rapid breathing. It's another yoga technique, but you breathe all the air out of your body <sighs> with a big roar <sighs> and then it's <sighs> and you're gonna do that about 30 times and take a big breath and then let it all the way out. And these will create different states of physiology, different states of mind. Uh, you'll find that your hands will warm up real fast, your feet will warm up real fast. So there's so many different ways and, and um, different techniques of breathing depending on what you wanna do. The most important thing I think for us is to get people to be aware that they can have control over their breath that most of us breathe unconsciously most of the day. There's a lot of time throughout the day where you actually are holding your breath. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I'll say to somebody, you're breathing? And I go, well, yeah. I go, well, check in because maybe you're not breathing. And I find that even through my day, there's moments where I realize, oh, I'm not really breathing. And you'd be surprised how long you can go without really breathing, right? It's just a shallow breath that you're getting. So it's more than pumping oxygen into your body. It is this connection with the cycles, it's connection with the environment, it's connection with the atmosphere. Um, and, and it could be argued that, you know, really we are the breath, right? Well, of course, we it is. life into us, right? Yeah, it, absolutely. So it could be absolutely. argued that we aren't this body, that we are the breath. And absolutely. I know that what we were starting to talk about earlier is, you know, is we're doing yoga, as we're doing the science of yoga, as we're bringing breath, as we're aligning our spine with a magnetic field and bringing the breath into all the areas of the body, you fall into that meditative state. You fall right. into, and I have felt oftentimes, and you and I've talked about this where I'm doing a seated meditation. I'm, I'm focusing on that breath and it looks like a sickle to me and it just mm -hmm. keeps coming in and out mm -hmm. to the point where I find my body's actually moving mm -hmm. and I feel like I'm, I'm being seesawed into this like lull. And then all of a sudden I'm like conscious of the fact that I'm almost like touching the ground in the back <laughs> because I'm like, so into this wave, but it's, it's like you said, it's like the, the air is pumping through me You're being and, and then it's, it's, it's inflating me and deflating me and inflating me and deflating me. And that yin yang is, 
is bringing me that life force that that it's bringing me life and yeah the other thing you can think of when you're breathing this is a really nice easy technique for folks is that when you inhale i'm bringing i'm bringing positive energy and i'm bringing the life force in i'm bringing oxygen in. i'm taking a deep breath on a conscious level okay i breathe in but when i breathe out as i breathe out I feel as if I'm taking that oxygen and forcing it down into the lower region of my body, below my belly button. So on the exhale, I'm pushing down in here. Now I'm going to inhale again. And my belly comes out. And when I exhale, I imagine forcing the air down into my body, not expelling it out. And you will build up prana. You will build up what the Japanese call chi in what's known as the hara. So if you take your, your index finger and you stick it in your belly button, and you put your hand down, where your pinky lies is considered the hara. It's the center of your body. It's the spiritual center of your body. It's where in the martial arts, we force oxygen down into you, force the energy that oxygen is for the body down into this. It's also the area spiritual, spiritually where you commit uh, ritual suicide. Right? I take the knife in, in, in Japanese culture and I put it here and I cut the hara open. If I cut this chakra open, I'm immediately dead. So it's a very important area to be conscious of when you breathe. And I breathe out. I'm putting energy down into this seat of the soul right in here. And, um, you know, it's a very powerful thing because it's known even in science that we get about 10% of your physiological energy through food. 90% of the energy that you actually get to function your body, to, to fire up your body every single day is it's through air. oxygen, yeah. is through air. And when I was a real little kid, pre-teenager, I used to tell my parents, oh, I don't need to eat, I just breathe. I don't need to eat, I just breathe. I was skinny, I was wicked skinny. But I felt like I could actually get nutrition from the air. I have no idea where that idea came from as a little kid. But I thought, oh, as long as I breathe, I get all the nutrition I need. And now, 50 years later, I realized that we really do get most of our nutritional needs through our air and about 10% of our nutritional needs through food. So we eat way too much and we breathe way too little. So when I worked with sled dogs at Cornell University doing nutritional research, we looked at two different things. We looked at how they use protein versus um, fats, and then we looked at their oxygen, oxygen uptake. And we did this with horses as well, and we did VO2 maxing. And I know so many of us do it essentially by doing Valsalva, and we have a lot of our colleagues that have machines in their office that do VO2 max. And what that really means is we're optimizing the amount of volume of oxygen in the cell by depleting the cell right. from all so of getting rid of all of the carbon dioxide, really depleting the body from that. And like you said, the body will naturally just breathe, in. breathe in. I think of one of our mentors said, you know, if you go to squish an ant, it's going to run out of the way, not because it goes, oh, a human's going to come squish me, but because its life force goes move mm -hmm. because it has an intention to want to live. And we all have that. So sure. if you exhale everything out, your body's just going to go and, and saturate the body now with oxygen. And that's a VO2 max situation. And what you're saying, and we do it with Valsalva here mm -hmm. in the office where you hold your breath bare down in that abdominal space and you just hold it for as long mm -hmm. as you can. It's much longer than you think. And then yeah. when you can breathe, you, you're like gasp in to breathe that air and you feel so much better and so much lighter and it helps well, your and parasympathetics. It, yeah, and it teaches the body to uptake oxygen. It's why fighters today, a lot of MMA fighters, a lot of boxers will put a mask on and they'll exercise really, really hard and they can't breathe through the mask very well. So they're literally forcing their system to work right, hard. To work hard. To and then when I don't wear the mask and I'm gonna fight, oh man, sucking oxygen in and giving it to my muscles is much faster and easier. Yeah. It's something that's been done in the last five or 10 years has become really known in the fighting world. It's to mask Almost yourself Almost suffocate up. them. Yeah, and they get on the treadmill and run your hiney off and, and then take it off and boy, do you breathe in a lot yeah. of oxygen? Yeah. And with, through your nose, like by just breathing in through your nose, first of all, you create nitrous oxide, which is great for viruses and everything else, but breathe in through your nose, you get more oxygen than through your mouth. Right, right. So, so there's so much to breathing. So much. So much. So a, a quick, simple tool you can use um, here. So I talked about, you can do your, 
box, box breathing, breathing, which is four out, four in. You can also do, what's the other one? And a hold on both sides. So it's so a it's four in, a four hold, a four out, a four hold at the bottom and then back around. So what that it takes means, a little consciousness. A, a hold at the top is when you breathe in, get all the way up there and hold it before, before. you exhale. And then Good. exhale. One, two, three, four, hold the bottom breath out. All the breath is out. One, two. And I'm not breathing three, any air in. I'm four. still forcing more out. So there was yeah. lots more. To come oh, there's out. Ton you can't force all the air out. Then then you're gonna breathe in again. So it's just an in breath, a hold for the four, an out breath for four, and a hold for four, and you go around that cycle. Yes. So that's one. Number two is there's two summits that come to mind. One is that Dr. Christine Schaffner did that wasn't a summit, what it was a 21 day lung detox program that's still available. Um, which I was taught on that as well. And I taught some breathing techniques on that in my hour. Um, but the whole 21 days was about resetting your lungs and detoxifying your lungs. And it, it revolved around breath. And there was a lot of education in that 21 awesome. day around breath as well. And then the Body Electric Summit, which is coming up in, in the end of February, where I taught in there about some breath work as well that I'm realizing. Because essentially what we've come to grips with is from a heart rate variability, from a regulation perspective, which is what we do. We're not doctors, right? We're <laughs> biological investigator, medical intuitives that understand this concept of regulation and this, and we assess it through heart rate variability, through um, uh, contact regulation, thermography, through muscle response testing. And we find that if we get that body better at going into the parasympathetic, better at deep breathing, better that at being, all of a sudden, then it'll heal. Everything heal. starts to change. All the body of systems course. start to change and start to turn on and get better and they heal and they, they get better and better. And I, I went from, oh, you need all this physical medicine. No, you just really need to learn how to breathe, be conscious of your breath and, and get the breath into all the areas of your body while your spine is erect in a line yeah. and watch the healing occur yeah. inside you. You got this. You don't need us. You need you and being able to engage your own inner physician, your own inner wisdom. You have all of that inside you. That's what the beats is about is, is empowering you with this information and giving you real tangible things that you can do at home. And then there's the 10 penny roll, yeah. Take 10 pennies or hundred dollar bills or thousand dollar bills. I don't care. 10 is something put it in this pocket. Every single time you think of it, take one out, take 10 conscious breaths, put it in this pocket. At the end of the day, you've taken a hundred deep breaths and you train your body to get into the deep breathing. There's no way this man could be with That's me great. for 23 years if you didn't teach me That's how to breathe a long time ago because I am trying to slow down how I talk. Really, I am for my podcast. But the reality is there's just so much we want to give you and there's so much information out there that can help you have tools in your tool belt to engage your own immune system, to gauge your own ability to heal. You don't need anybody else to do this. You can do this. Yeah, because, I mean, the bottom line is everyone knows that tens of thousands of cells are dying every single day in my body. I'm losing tens of thousands of cells are dying, right. dying, dying, dying. And tens of thousands of cells are being replaced. So my body knows how to do that. My body knows how to heal that. If we make sure that the blockages to those healing experiences are removed, then the body's natural tendency is to heal. And one of the things that really help do that, especially on a cellular level, is the ability to breathe and breathe appropriately. And like I said, it affects your physiology, definitely. And it absolutely affects your psychology, which, you know, I think today people are suffering more in a psychological, mental, emotional way than they are physically. And that's why Sound the Soul, really, which is the soul sponsor of the beats is so important to us because this takes your heart rate variability and that reconnects. spaces and connects you back to you through your breath because yeah. all you have to do is breathe and this unit will work and and then you hear your music that your breath essentially is making that your, your heart, heart rate is making, is making. Yeah. and it's a beautiful way to allow your body to go into that healing capacity yeah. And flow press is another way we do that because what we've discerned again in our years is that if we help people get into that deep state of relaxation, if we help them be conscious about their breathing, if we give them that tool, the healing occurs. Sure, sure. Yeah. So share this with your friends. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we'll see you next time on The Beats. Breathe.